I'm Daniel Engelman from Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm the uh, president of the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery International Society, and here I have some of my fellow board members and uh, experts who are going to discuss the intraoperative and postoperative components of enhanced recovery. This is the second of a uh, two-part series on enhanced recovery. Uh, I'd like you to introduce yourselves. So my name is Rick Aurora from Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, I'm Michael Grant. I'm from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Kevin Labdell, Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Louis Perrault, Montreal Heart Institute, Montreal. So we're just going to jump right into ERAS and uh, intraoperatively. So we're going to make believe now we're in the operating room and we have a patient on the table and we're going to go straight to our anesthesiologist, Dr. Grant, and ask him intraoperatively what are some of the anesthetic components of a successful ERAS pathway. Yeah, sure. So I think before I begin, I think the easiest thing to say first is to, is to remind everybody that there's no prescribed protocol of sorts. Um, that, that much of what we will recommend are going to be things that should be sensitive in some respects to the expertise that you have at your hospital and the resources you have at your disposal. Now that being said, I think there's probably three major areas that your anesthesia team in concert with your uh, intraoperative program can, can really focus on. And that would be, um, I think everybody should have short-acting anesthetics that end at the end of the procedure, which is something I think we, we often forget should be a focus of our of our anesthetics. The other thing is that we should be focusing on multimodal analgesia. The idea of reducing opioids as much as humanly possible, and as you guys know, um, the backbone of the anesthetics, at least to date, have been largely opioid-based. And I think the third thing is to develop protocols that are goal-directed. So things like fluid protocols, perfusion protocols. Mm -hmm. And the real goal there, obviously, is for you to maintain perfusion to those organ systems, and then, you know, subsequent to that, reduce some of those injuries. Dr. Perot, as a surgeon, you're in the operating room. Do you believe that the sternal closure technique may contribute to how a patient perceives post-op pain, maybe some complications such as sternal union, non-union, or infection, ambulation restrictions? Well, uh, as an intro, I would say that, you know, all the surgeons believe that the way they close is the best one. And there are so many different techniques, you've got to wonder whether there's one that's superior. But if you, the most important thing is to look at data, and there, there is data on sternal fixation, prospective randomized uh, data, well controlled, that have shown a benefit in terms of sternal union, lesser pain, and uh, less discharge to uh, uh, other facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So we gotta look at the data, not the beliefs. And this is, we talked about, this is one of the hurdles, data. Let's look at data and bring it to all of our patients. So uh, short answer, yes, there is benefit in uh, st rigid sternal fixation. I noted in the uh, ERAS guidelines that it's recommended that all patients receive some antifibrinolytics such as uh, TXA, transexemic acid, or uh, Amacar, aminocoproic acid. Um, is that uh, widely uh, practiced, do you think, across the uh, North America or the world for that matter? Or do you think there are, for any of you, uh, institutions that still may not think that's sort of the standard of care? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, it is standard of care, definitely. And I, I don't think there are many, at least uh, in Canada, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it's, it's been a given for a long, long time. So um, this is one of the easy ones. I think the data shows that there's benefit and uh, very little drawbacks. How about um, modification of chest tube management, uh, given recent evidence that retained blood may contribute to increased atrial fibrillation? pericardial and pleural effusions. Has that changed the way you manage things? Well, yes, uh, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, we've been draining the, the chest for the, the same way for such a long time, and the, all of us have uh, complications associated with poor drainage. Uh, may it be, uh, you know, late or early tamponade, uh, pleural effusions, and there seems to be a link now with retained blood around the heart and post-op AFib, which is no matter what you do, it's uh, still ho hovering at least at the 30% mark. So I think that there is no, now new technology that enables chest tubes to main, uh, remain patent, and there's data, uh, pretty solid data, that shows that there is a benefit in terms of less retained blood complications and uh, most likely a less post-op AFib. So I think it's a simple way to prevent complications and obviously this is ERAS, you prevent complications, recovery will be enhanced. 
Dr. Grant, how about the utilization of ketamine as an anesthetic agent? Is there, is there a role in ERAS? Should we be using more of it? Benefits? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, I'll say in my own practice, ketamine is, is one of the basics. We use it for virtually all of our cases. And why is that? <laughs> You know, there's some data, at least in the past, that suggested there may be a benefit from a delirium standpoint. I think there are some recent studies that maybe question whether or not that's the case. Mm -hmm. But what we do know from particularly the spine literature, and I think you can use this in somewhat surrogate form for cardiac, um, but this really does allow you an opportunity to reduce some of the opioid burden, not only in the operating room, but then subsequent to the operating room as well. You know, if you think about it, this is a relatively cheap and actually quite easy thing to administer. And it's predictable if you use it in subhypnotic doses, so something that really won't have side effect profile for the patient, but then may have genuine, long-lasting benefits from an opioid sparing standpoint. So let's sort of transition out of the operating room now. Now you, your patient's arrived in the intensive care unit. Uh, Dr. Lobdell, are there any suggestions in how one might reduce the burden of acute kidney injury following cardiac surgery? Good question and a major focus of our ERAS efforts. I think that the things that uh, we can do uh, largely relate to goal-directed therapy, which we touched on early or in the operating room, but also, you know, setting those standards in the uh, ICU, how you're going to monitor them, how you're going to manage the threats, i.e., if we're not on track, that sort of thing, and then even some of the more uh, novel methods to make diagnosis, like the biomarkers that are available. There's a lot of good work that's done not only in helping diagnose AKI and then hopefully we're modifying our approach, but even looking at long-term outcomes and the risk associated with it. So I think uh, the focus on kidney injury is something that um, we're finding incredibly important because the risk is far greater than just the low urine output or even the change in creatinine that we may see. The, uh, Dr. Aurora, uh, mm -hmm. what are some of the ERAS components that you're most concerned about in the intensive care unit following so, cardiac surgery? So I think some things we've talked about, appropriate pain control, minimizing opioid use, post-operative nausea and vomiting, mobilization, and delirium is one that links a lot of these concepts together. Mm -hmm. So delirium is an acute confusional state characterized by features of inattention, changing levels of consciousness, and um, disorganized thought processes that has both in-hospital and long-term outcomes following surgery. And it's, a, I think, a really good example of how ERAS can target a problem that's very complex and ubiquitous, like delirium. At least one in four to one in five of our patients will have delirium after heart surgery. And part of that can be helped by looking preoperatively, uh, looking at preoperative risks, things as age, previous substance use, long-term mental health conditions, previous delirium, et cetera. Identifying risk in those patients, communicating that to the intraoperative team, to the ICU team when they first come there, then working with your post-operative team to try to find ways to mitigate that risk. So your pharmacists in terms of doing a medical reconciliation, appropriate opioid uh, use, mobilization, and then looking for it on a regular basis to identify when it occurs using a systematic screening tool. And there are several out there that you're probably aware of that are, are very useful for your team to use and ensure that you're doing it on a high quality basis. And not just in the ICU, but also on the post-operative ward as they go down, or wherever they go from your ICU, uh, is to ensure that they're protected when they go down to that environment as well. Now that you've brought up the uh, opioid uh, issues, uh, Dr. Grant, uh, which multimodal pain meds would you recommend to reduce opioid utilization in the days following cardiac surgery? Yeah, you know, I'd say we're at the point now where I think if patients aren't receiving standing, scheduled, things like Tylenol, gabapentin, just as a baseline, I think you're, you're probably a little bit behind. And I'd say that if you want to layer on some of the, what maybe are considered a little more esoteric pieces, things like regional nerve blocks, um, you could add in ketamine on the floor, for example, again, subhypnotic doses. I think there are, there are numerous options that we really just aren't using in our armamentarium. Now, one point that I think is important is that we have a black box warning around the use of NSAIDs, particularly for cabbage, and I think that, you know, despite what you may think about the literature that led to that warning, um, I do think that it's at least something that we should have conversations around. Does it make sense for it in your cabbage population? But in particular, if you're doing a valve surgery or aortic surgery, um, 
I, I think that the use of NSAIDs in a scheduled fashion is also probably advisable at this point. Yeah, I would add in though that maybe we should uh, be restricting that to patients that have shown no sign of kidney stress or kidney injury because that's really uh, the patients that seem to get into trouble with uh, NSAIDs. So I think that's paramount and you know one of the things that came out of again some of the other surrogate literature and other service lines is that when we think about things like goal-directed fluid if we end up on the restricted side of that and we actually potentially cause injury the addition of something that would tax the kidneys on the other side is only going to exacerbate that problem. So, so I think that's a great point. It's like a two-hit theory. N no question the about kidneys. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you, uh, any of you uh, have any thoughts about whether all patients after cardiac surgery uh, should receive chemical thromboprophylaxis to reduce the incidence of DVTs? Because way back in the day it was felt that all these patients were uh, bleeding, uh, hypocoagulable and that nobody was going to get a DVT or PE, but over the last couple decades we've realized we're actually completely wrong. If anything, they're probably hypercoagulable. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what would you I'll, say? I, I would say that barring some specific concerns, we should be evaluating that, uh, you know, going into the first night after surgery and then planning on starting uh, some form of therapy on the first post-operative day. Uh, barring something unforeseen. There have been some good studies uh, that have shown that, like many things in medicine, there's a surveillance bias. What we think happens and what really goes on when we look for it uh, regularly are quite different. I think one good study showed the incidence of DVT after cardiac surgery was as high as 13, 14 percent, whereas if you look at the uh, rate of DVT, say, in the STS database or even less common, the uh, pulmonary thromboembolus that's associated with it, it's, it's much lower, order of magnitude lower. So somewhere in there, there's a gap in our understanding and an opportunity to probably tailor our therapy, but I think it's generally accepted that we should be starting it as soon as the first post-operative day, um, or certainly no later, would be put another way. Dr. Perot, are there any uh, novel informatics technologies uh, that can assist in uh, getting patients more engaged in their ERAS pathways? Well, there are a few platforms, and uh, we've actually been interested for the last three, four years uh, at the Montreal Heart, but also the other groups such as yourself uh, have started to look at those. We we've have an educational program that's uh, internet-based with a, a follow-up that's done with um, multiple emails on a daily basis in the post-op once the patient is discharged all the way up to a month. A patient uh, do surveys every day and I'm actually presenting this uh, this afternoon but the, the first eight, 800 patients and I was amazed how uh, they felt more less anxiety, more confident and it has an impact on less calls to the hospital and actually uh, some of it prevented in a great proportion a return to the ER so it is something on top of the patient satisfaction, which is really high, something that the reprogram should be looking at. And I think the other thing that's really important about it, it involves technology. And our patient population, again, being older and often, again, frail and other cognitive issues potentially, you wouldn't anticipate a high rate of use. But in fact, the rate of use is 70% or higher. Exactly. And once they start using, 80% or more continue using it there afterwards, even with people who are technology naive, which I think is fascinating. Uh, Dr. Perot future plans for the ERAS Society? Well, I, I think that the, if I was a younger surgeon, if I was a young surgeon, uh, I would look into this because the research possibilities are pretty much endless. I mean, so much of what we've been doing has not been evidence-based. And one of the things that hits me on top of the pre-op and the post-op is the intra-op. This is something, I mean, management on cardiopulmonary bypass has been done in, you know, a fly by your seat of your pants sort of way. And I mean, it, we need more data because a lot of the, the things that will occur, kidney injury, et cetera, et cetera, has to do with how the pump is managed. So I think this is an area of focus. All the PRO is also is an, a great area of PRO focus. PRO is the uh, patient reported outcome outcomes issues, too. Yes. I mean, we'll probably learn a lot and then we'll be able to focus and put together research questions because ultimately I think all of it has to be, I mean, all of it can't be studied in a randomized controlled trial, but I mean, we can compare protocols, compare the outcomes at different centers, but come up with, uh, you know, true important research questions and study them in a rigorous fashion. I think that's what we want ultimately. And what's great about this society is that it involves so many 
different disciplines, so a meeting of the minds to look at all the aspects. And uh, I think the, it's going to ultimately improve the whole field, and that's what we want. You know, just to piggyback that a little bit, one of the things I think we see as an opportunity here, and you, you touched on this a little bit, is that this is an opportunity for, for more pragmatic study design. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that we can have consortium building and look at observational data, yes, but actually do it in somewhat of a prospective and kind of an intelligent way. And to have those kind of adaptive research protocols, I think, would be really, really important. And it's an opportunity that we have with what we're doing in this initiative. I think that the standardization of best practice in the perioperative care of cardiac surgical patients has unfortunately been largely ignored by cardiac surgeons uh, for too long, and I think that's really uh, what it comes down to. Are there, uh, is it an open society? If anyone who's watching this video wanted to get uh, involved, are there any restrictions to joining? Not at all. I think uh, we've been all <clears throat> very inclusive, and uh, seriously, anybody that has near or far some kind of contact or some kind of input, uh, nutritionists, et cetera, et cetera, with uh, cardiac surgical patients are welcome. And I mean, this is, uh, I think, one of the strengths of the, this uh, society is the, the openness and the inclusiveness. And uh, again, some, some professionals that I don't even think about will come up with angles that surgeons never even considered. So that, I think that's very important to be uh, as inclusive as possible. Yeah, and I think, you know, that point, ERS is really a team sport. You need the entire team that really touches the patient, different components to contribute, perhaps in their own way as well. Including the nurses. Yeah. Physiotherapists. Pharmacists. OT, respiratory therapists. I agree. It's a multidisciplinary yeah. uh, game, and everybody uh, is welcome to join and uh, invited, and we need all their help. Uh, I'd like to thank this panel for joining us, and uh, this is part two of our two-part series on enhanced recovery after surgery. This is the uh, intraoperative and postoperative components. Thank you.